everybody, welcome to Drive Through Review 160. Today I'm going to talk about Mr. Madison's War, the Incredible War of 1812. A war that I have absolutely no clue about. I remember studying it probably for about three hours in history class over the course of two days when I was in high school or something. Uh, so I don't have a good grasp of what this war was about, but I had interest in this game. It's a card-driven uh, war game, strategy game. Um, that uh, I happen to enjoy a lot of. I like 1989 and Twilight Struggle and you know those kind of games. And so I had an interest in taking a look at this because it was about a subject that I was not familiar with. And in contrast to those games, which, you know, just to use a term that is probably not accurate, those are a little bit more of a Euro game where you have sort of just sort of a strict area control with some light war game elements in there and then some card play. This one is a point-to-point -point movement it's got counters, it's got different, you know, types of units. This one has naval battles, which I thought was going to be pretty interesting. And it's got your sort of, you know, traditional war game trappings, you know, wrapped in this card-driven uh, setup. So what I'm going to do is basically take you to different points in the game. And it kind of, I'll give you some rules, obviously, you know, during that part of the game. But also to sort of get into a little bit of the story of the game. Uh, one thing, it's just a personal thing for me with these kind of war games, uh, the stories uh, tend to come out a little bit, uh, you know, more clear to me than really anything else about the game itself. Uh, mechanically, they're there to serve, basically to deliver me a story, fictional as it may be, you know, in this sort of alternate history idea. But I'm going to go through, I'll show you some different uh, battles that happen. Uh, some different, uh, you know, specific card plays, and then I'll touch on sort of, the, you know, the general mechanics that way, and then give you kind of a sense of, uh, the game's a little bit of a conundrum, it's very interesting to me, uh, but, you know, not being super familiar with this kind of game, other than maybe Washington's War, which I dabbled in um, a while ago, and that way I would say that's probably the most, uh, you know, best contrast or comparison uh, would be Washington's War, not necessarily Twilight Struggle or anything like that. Uh, so well, let me, I'll, I'll go into all that and I'll come back and kind of share my conclusions uh, after this sort of walkthrough slash playthrough slash, you know, snapshot idea. So here we go. So like I said, we're going to take a look at a game in progress here. Now we're going into the spring and summer of 1813 at this point. We've just established some reinforcements on the board for the Americans and the British soldiers. There, on the first turn in the 1812, there was quite a bit of activity here in this uh, region here. So, uh, Rensselaer basically came in and took Fort St. George, uh, got some lucky dice rolls there, was able to get a little bit of a foothold, uh, but then he got kicked back out. And then Hall came, in, came up through the south area of Lake Erie here uh, to sort of kind of come and help out. However, that did leave this area open over here. Uh, for this uh, general here, a couple generals in there actually, and uh, the Brits got control of this lake here, as well as the lake up here at the north. Uh, now, thankfully for the Americans, uh, some reinforcements have come in at Fort MacArthur here, and uh, and also the Americans got a nice uh, reinforcement stack here down in Albany. So hopefully they can start to work their way up north, up into Quebec, where you can see a nice big old stack of uh, of land units there. Uh, so not a lot has gone over, uh, happened over here on the uh, eastern side of the map. So like I said, I will give you a little bit of a breakdown of what's happened in terms of the gameplay mechanics here. Now you basically have two rounds of card play in each of the years. So you got the spring and summer, summer and autumn, and then a short wintering phase with some wintering attrition and possible some winter events. Then we go into 1813, deal some new cards out, uh, you know, spring and summer, and then summer, autumn, and winter again, and then 1814. Now you can see here in 1812, each player is going to get seven cards in 1812, and then eight cards there in 1813. However, to start the game, it actually is a little bit of an interesting idea. So what you're going to do is actually going to start with the American player drawing a card, taking a look at the card, and then using it for possibly its operations value. During this little sort of pre-war setup, you ignore the event, you can use the op value, to maneuver troops, but you can't invade any many territory. So if you look over here on the board, you can see you've got uh, you know red uh, territory for the Brits to start and blue for the Americans. Now you can't move into obviously Americans into the Brits uh, during the pre-war phase, but you can choose to play off values to sort of 
uh, muster troops, possibly build some ships, which is going to be very important for lake control. And you really want to get the ships built because the ships don't come out, uh, you know, automatically during the reinforcement. You have to actually build them, and then the reinforcement chart tells you, you know, where you can build them. So you can choose to play this for operations, or you can keep it and make it part of your hand as you start the game. So the American player is going to take, uh, you know, one card. The Brit player is going to take a look at a card, possibly use it for its ops value or play it. Now just real quick you can see here this has sort of an American symbol and a Brit symbol. So this what the symbol means is basically this shows you who can use it for the event. Uh, so in this case the, this one here the, only the American could use it. In this case the Brit player could use either one. So in this case the Brit player maybe keeps that. So you're going to go all the way through this and somewhere in the top 14 cards is this declaration of war. As soon as this happens basically that wastes the card play uh, for whoever drew that. And that triggers war, so now you can start invading and attacking each other. So you're going to basically count all the cards that you've either played or kept, subtract that from seven. So if we'd each drawn a card, and then the American player maybe drew this, that would have been their second card. So they're going to draw back up to five cards. The British player would draw six cards, and so that would be a total of seven uh, cards for your starting hand. You're going to count those, those initial cards as part of your hand. I just thought I'd give you a quick little showing of the player aids and talk about a little bit of mechanics here. So you can see you've got the British start positions there for 1812. This will be to start the game. And it's going to show you the ships that are going to be in play. But again, you have to construct these uh, before they actually get out onto the board. And you're going to need to spend some time doing that because it's going to be very important uh, for getting uh, victory point control here. So you can see here, uh, at the end of 1812, the Brits had control of this lake and that's going to get them two points. And they really needed to do that in this case because the Americans got control here. They also were able to, uh, you know, take this, but then they lost it. And then this guy was able to come in here and take, uh, and take this fort here because it was undefended because of the American activity up north. And then so the Americans also were able to get some cards to uh, play for victory points. So some cards actually you just play them and they'll give you victory points if you've met a condition or sometimes not even a condition. So the Americans have a little bit of a lead there to start, but they would have a lot more of a lead if the Brits had not uh, taken over some of these uh, naval areas here. And not only are the naval areas, uh, you know, important for controlling, uh, you know, uh, victory points, but also for moving some troops around and, you know, kind of getting around quickly instead of, you know, wasting a lot of time traveling around the lakes. So the travel has been really interesting so far in this game as far as sort of you know, spreading yourself out and trying to, you know, move a lot of troops at once. It's very difficult to do that. And especially in that first turn, things kind of move a little bit slower in, in the 1812 turn. And then you can see how these, you know, stacks of units start to come in. You'll be able to get a little bit more activity, a little bit more action. But one thing you're going to need to take a look at here is this number here as well. And this is going to be the victory points that you're going to acquire if you capture an enemy territory, but also during the wintering phase, the amount of land units that can be there. Now there are some, you know, uh, leaders and ship units here that aren't counting against that. But as you kind of move, it's going to be hard to build up, you know, a lot of a nice stack of troops and get them to where you need to be, you know, before winter comes and then you have to basically attrition them. Now the last round did see some combat and the combat is pretty interesting. And I actually read a little bit of the designer notes in terms of combat. So it's not your normal CRT table where you have sort of columns and rows and then you have basically your odds and then you roll against that and maybe have a column shift left or right. What you're actually going to do is you're going to get um, your attack values and then uh, you know equate them. So if we look over here real quick we can take a look at some of these. And so some of these guys here have, uh, he's reduced there, but you know they have an attack value. So you're going to add up all of these, add up all the attack values of the uh, the defenders and then you're going to get a ratio down over here and this is what this is going to do is going to give you a modifier to your die roll because when you do combat you're going to roll 2d6 actually which is a little bit random but it kind of makes sense and it makes it a little bit exciting actually for the battles so you're going to do that you're also going to apply any other modifiers uh, you can see over here some of the leaders will apply a combat modifier you'll get uh, negative modifiers if you track across one of these major invasion routes if you go into a fort uh, there's a couple other modifiers like that you're going to apply all of those and then you're going to roll your 2d6 and then you're going to check your results here and there's you know a list of results these are typical 
attacker retreats if they roll poorly you know maybe take step losses and then if you, you know, roll good then the defender will treat and then if the defender is actually in a fort uh, you know then if you roll here they're actually going to ignore but if you roll really well they're going to retreat anyway now the interesting part about attacking is you also have to define a lead unit and the lead unit cannot be a reduced unit so this one actually has been reduced here uh, if you you define that and then any hits are going to be absorbed by the lead unit there and so each uh, side lead units actually has a little modifier there a b and a c so if you pick uh, a higher uh, you know a or a is higher than b and b is higher than c that'll also uh, you know modify the roll so that is after the 1812 turn i have not had any uh, naval combat as yet um, basically what we're trying to do is, is build up on the victory point track here if you know if britons get uh victory points they're going to reduce this and then if they get down to zero and then get more victory points they'll flip this up on its red side there and then you'll come back up this way you can see you've got sort of a marginal victory decisive victory over there uh there is a way to do auto win if the americans ever capture quebec which looks <laughs> pretty unlikely at this point uh they'll get a sort of an instant decisive victory and then if we go down here there's a couple of places down here uh, if the Brits get three of the four places, uh, they get an instant victory. And before I move on here, I just wanted to look at a couple of cards. This is currently the British hand here, uh, going into the first round of 1813. So again, we've got the ops points. We've got the event that they could use. This is actually a winter event, though, so you actually have to hold this card if you want to play it at winter, sort of a last-ditch surprise. Because if we look up here, again, you can see spring, summer, summer, autumn, and winter. Now winter is very short, there's an attrition phase, but if you hold any of those winter events, you can spring those if you've held any of those into the next round. And so what the British player will have to do, will have to decide, okay, do I want to use this ops point maybe for a one-off value to, you know, uh, activate a leader with a activation value of one, or do I want to hold it? Now each round you can hold two cards. You basically just take and put a card face down. You can do that twice uh, in a round. And so here we've got another card uh, you know, this one is a battle card. So you can, again, you can play for the hops or play for the event. This event, though, is not going to be played normally on your turn. It's going to be played during a battle. And this is a very specific one here. Some of them are more generic. Will allow you, again, to uh, modify the uh, the combat role. And so let's see. The next card here, this is an event battle here. And so this can be played uh, sort of in, in two circumstances here. So it's got a nice op value. Uh, this is now this one's for the American because it's got the American flag uh, So the Brit's not really going to use this for the event, but if the American had it uh, He could play it um, Can play in a battle where Tecumseh is present and that is a Indian leader So that's that card. Uh, let's see this one. Here's just another event Here we've got an operations and a battle here uh, so you can activate this and it allows plus two modifier of any units that attack so you can activate some units and then get some attacking there Let's see, where's the other ones in here? So here's a reaction card. This is a little bit different. Hadn't seen this yet quite in a, you know, a typical war game CDG. So play this card after an enemy force activates. So you have sort of opportunities as you activate and actually before you move sometimes uh, different units, you can play it as a reaction. It doesn't count as your turn, but you're going to be down a card. And so you've got to make a decision there. Am I going to use this for the ops or maybe trying to reaction to sort of stop uh, the enemy? Okay, so we're about halfway through the 1813 turn. Just give you a quick little update here. So what happened here is a little bit interesting. Uh, the Americans went in here and basically destroyed a town. They occupied a town and they were able to play an event card. Uh, basically, that the event card gives them two points. So they lost the two points for controlling the town, but then the town has now been destroyed. The Brits can no longer use it for wintering or quartering. It's basically reduced this value down to zero. And then they were able to move on and go up here north of Lake Ontario. It took some losses here, but we were able to push the Brits back. We also took some losses. One thing that's interesting about this, and we'll kind of move over here a little bit, is you can start to see these stacks get a little bit bigger. And I mentioned that earlier. So but what's going to start to happen here is the, the players are going to have to sort of like trickle and sort of leave breadcrumbs of, of, of troops and landing it's here to retain control. Because remember, these are also worth victory points, and they're also, you have to have uh, units of that combat value to be able to be considered to own uh, that space. Now, if we look at the score, it hasn't really changed that much, but the board is definitely starting to change, uh, I think, a little bit swinging towards the Brits at this point. 
So if we look over here, this was largely ignored over here uh, on, on the eastern side of the map. So you can see that stack that was up there in Quebec is now moved down. And as I said, they started to trickle out, actually wiped out some American forces. And so the stack has kind of been thinned out a little bit as they take control of some of these territories here. Nobody's grabbed this lake for whatever reason, probably because they've been too busy with the activity over here in the center. And that's one thing to keep in mind is, you know, you don't get a lot of turns really. I mean, this game is going to be a re relatively short game. Uh, you know, relatively, uh, compared to, you know, some longer war games that, that maybe take on a, an entire war scope. Now, this one doesn't cover, uh, you know, anything that happened in the southern, uh, you know, in the part of the United States. This is all northern United States. But, uh, and again, like I said, you've got to build up uh, naval ships. You've got to, you know, you've got to spend these precious cards here to build up naval ships. And you're basically eating a turn doing that. Uh, so this kind of activity has really sort of consumed the players over here. Meanwhile, this over here, there's a lot of ripe fruit for pickings over here. In this stack here at Albany, maybe this is bad play, I'm not sure at this point. But, you know, the U.S. and the Americans here have built up a nice stack of land units here. And you can see that you can actually have 12 units there anyway to winter. They've felt okay to sit here and sort of rest, maybe let the Brits thin out a little bit. We'll see what happens as... Uh, the turn moves forward. So, just wanted to show you a quick example of naval combat. And this is going to be a very one-sided combat here. You can see we had Perry in here uh, with a brig uh, controlling this lake here. Now Barclay is going to move in here and he's got a whole mess of ships. So basically, if you have more ships than the other guy, you add plus one. If you have twice as many, you add plus two. Um, if one side had only uh, small ships, which would be sloops or schooners, they would get a minus one. Uh, this guy here has a brig, and then this other side also has a brig, so there's no uh, washout there. There's no combat factor on, uh, you know, the naval units like there is in the land units. You can see there's a combat factor. You do have to also present a lead unit here. Now, thankfully, this guy has an A, and so we'll take a look here. He's got an A there, so we can present that. Now, one thing is interesting, though, with these combat tables, and I, this has happened a couple times in the game now, and this may be a little bit irritating for folks. I don't think, you know... I don't know, I hate to say something like this, but most war games will have a problem. But this is can be a very kind of swingy, um, you know, combat results table here. So if you get a good solid roll on a double, the modifiers really kind of balance out here. So let's say if I'm in there, let's say, I don't know, 5 to 1, and I get a plus 3 here. But I come down here and I roll snake eyes, that's going to give me a 5. Okay, attacker retreats. But I outnumbered them 5 to 1. But from what I've read here in the, you know, the designer notes, this is actually very historically accurate. So I think approached from sort of a simulation perspective, uh, that's going to make a little bit more sense because there were some battles apparently during this war, which I don't know anything about, uh, that were almost unexplainable in that, you know, a small force could repel such a large force or a large force uh, would retreat, you know, for, for inexplicable reasons. So I just wanted to give you a quick brief uh, talk about the naval combat and also talk a little bit more about the combat in general there. Now here's a good example of some of the flavor of these event cards here that are going to bring in the game. So if you look at this one here, the British player can play this. Basically you play it for the event, British player scores two victory points. Pretty, you know, vanilla effect. But if we look at the flavor text here, it says, By 1813, the blockade was not the only thing affecting the U.S. economy. Raids led by Admiral Cockburn tied up thousands of soldiers which could have been used on the Canadian front and damaged American morale. So Cockburn raids the Chesapeake. So not only, um, one thing that it mentioned here is the, the raids and the blockade which happened in the southern portion of the United States or more south than, uh, than uh, you know, upper, upper west side New York or whatever. So this is kind of an interesting thing. So you basically play this card and score two victory points and go, okay, well, why? And then you just take a look at that text there. And then the British player is playing that on this turn basically because they're getting a little bit frustrated. Again, a little bit creamed uh, for the most part. The Americans have currently a marginal victory here. Uh, they are able to stop with one of these reaction cards uh, an assault here because the American was going to start to send out that giant stack of counters to try to repel uh, the incoming army from Quebec up north there. And so they actually have another one of these ready to basically get the American player to waste their turn. But I just wanted to show you a little bit more about these cards to give you an idea, you know, what they're like. 
Okay, just to wrap up here, we're going into winter of 1813, about to go into the last couple turns of 1814. U.S. Has, uh, Americans have got a little bit of a lead there. Uh, interesting game with the idea of the victory point track to me seems almost like a morale track because I don't really see a whole lot of headway that's going to happen here. Now, I, you know, as far as like a, I don't know, the war seems confusing to me. Not, 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 not really the game's fault, uh, but I think it was a very sort of, you know, what the heck kind of war idea here. So we can see the, the Americans trying to move up, uh, you know, to Quebec there, uh, and then the Brits have sort of retreated to kind of hole up. And um, that would probably come down to almost a die roll, I think. So if you look over here, everything's still kind of the same. Everything's kind of spread out. Uh, you know, there's trickling of, of land units all around and trying to basically kind of, you know, grab victory points here and there. Uh, nothing too substantial uh, in a sense. It, it feels very substantial when you play it, but the topography or whatever it doesn't seem to change a whole ton. You just kind of, kind of squabbling over, over victory points in some ways. Uh, so uh, I'll, I'll, I'll wrap up here and then give you kind of my final thoughts. Okay, I hope you enjoyed that overview slash, uh, you know, mashup slash cut up uh, approach. Uh, this game, uh, just what well, I wanted to tell you that uh, at the end there, it had the, um, the forces from Albany kind of going north. And that was right again at the end of the 1813. Well, what, what happened is the Quebec... Uh, area was basically given like eight counters of reinforcement so that stack basically went boop and so the americans smash into that and then you know it just kind of fizzles apart from there and that just to want to keep a uh, note on that because the interesting thing about this game is it's it's interesting and i don't know enough about the war and i wish there was maybe a little bit more information about the war and i can there is some reading you know material provided uh at the back of, of one of the books and it's really just about grabbing sort of almost random territory. I mean, in a sense, you're trying to get it for victory points, which in a sense is a morale idea. So it almost you get to the point where it feels like it's a propaganda kind of thing. It says, okay, we've got this, you've got this, you know, haha, we have more than you kind of thing. But there's no real like, you know, I don't think that during this war, the Americans were like, we're going we're gonna to invade and we're going to take over Quebec and we're going to keep it. I mean, I could be wrong about that. Like I said, it, it, that's not clear, clarified at all um, what really the ultimate purpose was. It was an offshoot of some European wars, uh, which, you know, the United States had to sort of deal with because they weren't the cultural focus at that time. Um, anyway, but uh, so it, it, it makes for an interesting sort of kind of extended quagmire kind of idea, which was what's interesting. And so when I played the game, I played it basically playing with the aggression level. So like how aggressive you're going to be, where you're going to be aggressive. But the purpose of like, why am I being aggressive for this spot was basically mostly tactical. There was no sort of um, philosophical or political feeling that I got from the game. Now, some of the flavor cards that, you know, like I pointed there, talk about the rest of the war and maybe there's some links back to Europe in some way, maybe not, but that's there, but it's very much just this one theater and, and really a lot about the Navy and, 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 you know, and controlling territory. And that's really about it. And, and I do like it for that aspect because it's a very sort of uh, filtered lens, uh, which you can, you know, which you can take a look at here. Uh, so, but it was interesting because, you know, it's, it's not really like, you know, Twilight Struggle, I'm trying to basically take over the world. It kind of, it feels like that, right? You know, communism wins or the United States wins or something. And so you feel like, okay, well, we won the world or, or, you know, we're now the superpower. Where this is more like, okay, I don't want you to get as big of a victory as I get as big of a victory. So it's almost like a, a, a PR type of thing, a saving face kind of war. Uh, you know, remnants of maybe the Revolutionary War were in there. Which is interesting, um, you know, just from a game perspective, as somebody that plays a lot of Euro games myself, it's like, okay, you know, you get the points and you win. Or this is one that's like, hey, you know, you got two more points than me, or six more points, or 12 more points than me. And it's not so much a game in that sense, it starts to pull into the simulation aspect of it. Uh, the other thing I touched on, touched on in the walkthrough was the dice rolling in the combat. You know, there was two or three times that I can think of where a superior force was there to no effect. Either on defense, they got wiped out. 
uh, by a really nice die roll by the attacker, or the attacker moving in with like, you know, four to one or whatever, but you got to add in all those modifiers of the forts and the, and the lead units and the terrain that you cross, and you're going to bring that die roll modifier right down, even though you've got a nice odds, and then you roll poorly, and you've basically smashed into uh, a fortified position in some respects, basically just to get, uh, uh, you know, for no effect. So uh, I think I like that part of the game. I like that they made that decision. But I think maybe from a game perspective, some people won't be very satisfied with that. But I think from a, a simulation kind of war game uh, idea and just sort of an exploration of the topic, I think that that serves its purpose and I think it was a good decision. But I think, you know, if you're coming at this to play it as a Twilight Struggle kind of idea, which is, it's more of a game than this one. I mean, you know, I think people know what I'm trying to say there. I'm not trying to begrudge either one anything. But I think people, if they come at it with that perspective, Maybe they won't, you know, enjoy that part of it. Um, but yeah, I like the production quality. The counters are, you know, the art's nice. I really like the map on the board. It's really nice. I hope, you know, with the camera moving around, you're able to get a good sense of the different lakes and the different, you know, size of the lakes and sort of the, um, I don't know, the handcuffs of, of the movement and, and all that kind of different stuff. It, that's very interesting. And, and it, I think from, you know, whatever the game may lose in sort of its political, philosophical, uh, objectives that maybe it didn't have any uh you make up for that in the terrain and the topography and, and all that kind of different stuff um so yeah and uh and i like the cards the, the the decision making with the cards is is still very very gamey you know it's very you know there's a lot of nice uh, decisions there meat wise as far as do i hold this for a battle i've got a reaction card I've got another card that's it's only going to help me if I'm around Montreal. I've got another card that's only going to help me uh, around uh, like Brigton or something. There was one that was down along those middle lakes there. If I hold that, I can surprise that and really affect those die roll modifiers. Because again, you get your odds and then you lock into a die roll modifier that you modify up and down. And so that sort of surprising action and the reactions and the battle cards uh, really add to that part of it. So, yeah, I would say definitely take a look at it. I think it's a very high-quality game, and uh, and I think uh, I would like to have seen more um, data about the war, but I don't know that that was really the goal of the game either. So, But it's maybe it's got me picked up enough to go and just read up a little bit, get a little bit more nice summary detail on uh, Wikipedia or something, or maybe even a little bit further than that. But I really like this. It's a quality game, and uh, uh, it's good. So I do recommend it. So, anyway, thanks.